So thank you, uh, Newt, and sorry about that. We're recording this, so I'm going to occasionally just stand right in front of the computer so that anybody who wants to watch this in the future can see something, even though it means that you don't see much clearly, but uh, it'll work. So apologies to the front row. I'll peer over once in a while, but you know I'm still here. Um, so uh, as, as Newt said, I have a connection to this place. Um, I, I, uh, Life partner and wife, Angie Spickard, who's in the back row. Wave, hi, Angie. Uh, we met here. Uh, Angie uh, did her master's degree with Dave Carell, who's an active faculty member here, and you all know. Um, and I spent four four summers, and two two of those were summer spring sessions up here. And they've uh, ever since held an important place in my heart. So whenever I get a chance to come back, I've, I've engaged in a variety of different research partnerships with people who, who work here in the summer. And it's mostly as a chance to just spend time with them and get back here. And, and, and so it's a real honor to be able to be invited to give a, 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 signature, a signature lecture and be a part of a really uh, uh, important lecture series. Uh, so I'm excited to, to be here. Um, I just wanted to speak for a moment about, uh, okay, the other thing I'll just mention real quickly is that the, my area of work is what I describe as uh, indigenous environmental studies. So my work is at the intersection of indigenous studies and environmental studies, um, and this talk is going to give you somewhat of an introduction about some of the, the main uh, concepts and, and, and topics that are covered in that emerging field. Uh, so hopefully, if you have any questions about, about that, just that, that broad that field, uh, the work that I'm doing and other people are doing in that area, please feel free to include that in our Q&A. Um, uh, so, you know, thank you to the BioStation uh, staff and administration for welcoming my family in here. My family and I here, we're going to spend a couple of days at the station. It's really exciting. Um, and I just wanted to say a quick note about my, my lecture style. So I don't, I, I'm not a lecturer really in my teaching. I don't use, I don't use lectures uh, hardly at all, like almost zero. And so, when I'm in, and so when I'm privileged to be invited to come somewhere and give a lecture, it's a, uh, I mean, I guess it's a, it's a unique challenge for me because I, it's just not my style. It's not my style of sharing information and, and learning and thinking together. So I take different approaches. What I what I what I typically do though is I don't have any canned lectures. So this is you know, if you look at my CV, you're not going to see this title anywhere else. This is it. It maybe it turns into something else, but it won't turn into another lecture. So this is a, this is a, a sort of a one-time shot, um, custom uh, <laughs> presentation. And what I do is I, I I wrote this for you. So this is a bunch of ideas and thoughts that I'm stitching together. That I wrote for this uh, for this uh, moment, um, and and so what that means is I have a couple of options. I can do bullet points, and I can step off to the side, and I and I can sort of go story mode, which is preferred. Uh, but I have a lot of different ideas that I want to weave in today. So the alternative is that I write the whole thing up, and I'm sort of reading it to you, trying to make eye contact, trying to make it. I've been to a lot of lectures in this space, and that's unusual. Usually, it's dynamic, whiz bang, lots of PowerPoint. Uh, very little reading. This is different, so it can feel a little more like a, a right? little bit of reading, very few slides, image rich, and hopefully the ideas are, are captivating. If not, you know, if you, if you close your eyes, uh, I'll just think you're reading just like this. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be sleeping at all. I'm like, okay, they're really taking it. There's not much in it. <laughs> you close your eyes, you won't. Um, I also just want to talk. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk for a moment about the uh, the words that 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 new chair, which focus on. I keep walking away from. I'm sorry to the, anybody who the one person who watches this later. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I keep forgetting about you. Uh, so the words that that new shared about the uh, the place where we are right now. What what when he talked about. The Sheboyganing uh, band, or also known as the Bird Lake Band, he talked about the Anishinaabek from this place. He was giving what we call a land acknowledgement or a ter ter territorial acknowledgement. And I just want to talk about the significance of those for a moment because um, honestly, they're, they feel like a new thing. Um, they feel like a new thing. Uh, they're not really new, but they're but they're new to academia. It's new to just have a lecture, random lecture, and then have somebody give a territorial acknowledgement or to 
be in your first day in a new class and have a professor give a land acknowledgement. That's sort of a new thing in non-tribal academic institutions. Um, but it's it's uh, it's important to, to 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 understand where this this sort of there's a little movement or a move at least to do these more, and I want to just contextualize that a little bit um, because it's easy to it's easy to misinterpret them as uh, as sort of a nod to political correctness. Uh, it's easy to think of them as something that people feel sort of obligated to do, and so they're checking the box. But I think what you heard Newt demonstrate is a, is a genuine acknowledgement of, of where we're at. And so um, uh, the, the land acknowledgement is a small way of recognizing the first stewards of a place. Uh, they're a way of recognizing that the so-called natural capital that we all share today is, is due to the work and care taken by generations of indigenous landscape. Uh, but uh, a genuine land acknowledgement is more than a recognition of shared heritage in natural resources resulting from Aboriginal land tenure. Um, and they're not specifically or only focused on historic societies, peoples, or cultures. A genuine uh, land acknowledgement like, um, like Newt gave, um, and, and, and one that's in these territories here in um, uh, Jiba Ganing, uh, specifically recognizes the work of living Sheboyganing and Anishinaabek, okay, uh, as, as Newt did. He recognized that people are around, they're still stewarding, they're still taking care of this place, they still have responsibilities for this place. Um, and so these Anishinaabek are continuing on from where their parents and grandparents took off, took, left off, and, and, and they took over, those people took over responsibilities from their parents and grandparents and so on and so forth. So when we do uh, uh, a genuine land acknowledgement, we're recognizing that genealogy from long ago time through to the current generation of caretakers. Um, and uh, it's, I think it's, you know, uh, it's also important to point out that these are not really new practices. As I said, they feel new in, in spaces like this, maybe they're new, um, but they're connected to longstanding protocols found within Anishinaabek and other indigenous political traditions, um, where uh, protocols where, where visitors to a territory not only thank their hosts for welcoming them, uh, but they acknowledge the work and the responsibilities involved in caring for local territories. Uh, some Anishinaabek refer to these protocols as Ganawenden Hakim Gagigadomi or taking care of land speeches. Uh, these political protocols go hand in hand with Bindige Ajimoen, uh, what we refer to in English as territorial welcomes, welcome speeches, or welcome stories. So that the latter, the Bindige um, Ajimoen, are performed by local indigenous leaders. Right? So Newt wouldn't give one of those. He'd give the, the former, uh, the acknowledgement. The welcome happens from a local leader. Um, and, 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 and besides welcoming visitors to their territories, what someone might do in one of these speeches, depending on the specific circumstances, is they, they may in, enfold explanations of the roles and responsibilities of both hosts and guests within their territories, essentially setting the ground rules uh, for whatever is planned. So uh, they might be setting the ground rules for negotiation. Or a learning experience, uh, or or a casual visit, whatever's planned. So, for example, when I was in Hawaii recently in January, uh, I went with a group of Anishinaabek folks, and we were learning about language revitalization efforts, indigenous language revitalization efforts in Hawaii. Um, and our hosts uh, told us that um, that we could be guests for just one day. So we were staying for a week or ten days. We could be guests for just one day. Uh, for one day, we could relax and they would take care of us. After that, we had to chip in like we were part of the family. No more free rides. Okay, so now you have to start taking a turn washing dishes like everyone else. That was part of their welcoming box. Um, it set the ground rules. So my point in going into all this detail is to share some insights about these practices because, again, they feel new in these spaces, and I think it's important to talk about them. Um,
think that, that land acknowledgements are becoming more common in university setting, settings because they're, they're, they're actually appropriate speeches for visitors to give when spending time in indigenous territories, whether that be on a federally recognized reservation or in the case of UMBS uh, in a treaty area or traditional territory. Uh, I have colleagues who, uh, who have worked in particular universities for, for decades and have just recently started doing the, uh, these sorts of acknowledgements, adding them to their syllabi, uh, bringing introductory words into the first day of class, and a, a, a jaded perspective is that what they're doing is jumping on some kind of a political correctness bandwagon or something. Uh, but the few people that I know who are bringing these protocols into their teaching are engaging in a very humble and respectful act of recognition, recognizing that a lot is owed to the first stewards of the territories where they now live in peace. Um, and I was going to share with you uh, this, this next slide is not going to make much sense because I, just in case Newt didn't do a land acknowledgement, I had prepared one. Um, and so I was going to talk about like the, the care that's been given by, by local uh, Habe folks and just say that, that um, you know, without that, you know, without that care, check this way. Another. Hmm, maybe a little IT help. Try the arrow. I tried the space bar. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry, hey, what? So what I was going to say is that um, that. Okay. So I was just going to share that with. Um, that without without the care of local land stewards, uh, uh, local Anishinaabe folks, um, uh, folks at University of Michigan Biological Station, students wouldn't have had the time, uh, wouldn't have wouldn't have had also. I'm sorry, let me back up and just say that. Um, so my my Anishinaabe elders, one of the things that they teach taught me and that they teach people is that if you're not actively engaging with plants and animals and other beings, that they'll go away. So that's one of our teachings. There's a lot more to it. That's just sort of a crypt note, but, there, but there's, there's more to it than that. Um, but but that's, that's a central teaching in our way of understanding the world. Uh, and so according to Anishinaabe ways of understanding things, without the stewardship and attention paid by the first people to this place and neighbor, neighboring areas, we may have never had the opportunity to spend time in um, Gashkibazo Miyashi. Um, the people recognize that spot there on the map. I'm gonna back, I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom out in a minute so you get a better sense of this. Uh, learning about uh, Beneshia with, with Francie or Dave or David, um, we may never have had a chance to uh, spend time learning about Meshkigaman and other plant relatives in Namitigomij, uh, Namitigomij, Mijig with, uh, uh, again, with Ed or Mel or Chuck. Um, and, and so, I just wanted to kind of make a, I just, I'm looking for any opportunity to bring the uh, Anishinaabe language into this talk, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and I'm going to just, I'm going to just back up so you can see a little bit more. This is, this is a little bit broader view of a map that was produced. I'm going to show you the credits here in a second. Feel free you, you won't be able to read any of this, but folks recognize where this is geographically, so um, straight, straight to map, I'm not here. Um, I should know so uh, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission made a, an atlas of the upper Great Lakes, uh, showing lots of different place names in the Great Lakes. Like, um, so this is just one little, one little slice of that. And this is this isn't even the whole thing. It doesn't go into lower northern lower Michigan, unfortunately, but it does go to Wisconsin. Look up off to their Great Lakes. Um, and so um, to get back on track here. I just wanted to share that land acknowledgements are, are simply reminding people uh, about the presence and the political positionality of indigenous peoples and indigenous nations. Uh, you know, for the past 250 plus years, settler Americans and, and their colonial forebears have attempted to erase indigenous peoples and nations from this continent, erase our histories, our protocols, our languages, 
our political systems, our educational systems, our ceremonies, our philosophies, and to counteract systematic and systemic attempts at erasure, we need to systematically and systemically shed light on indigenous presence and land acknowledgments are a small part of this process. Okay, so I know that's a lot about land acknowledgments, but people aren't really talking about what the, what's behind them. So I think it's important to bring it up and it also connects to other things that I want to talk about today. Um, another important way to highlight indigenous presence is by reading, hearing, and uh, using indigenous languages in our everyday lives. Uh, not just in tribal schools or in the homes of Native American families, <clears throat> uh, but in everyday spaces that we all occupy. Uh, so this is, a, this is a University of Michigan biological station logo that was designed by a UMBS student uh, that could be turned into lots of cool uh, swag that could be sold at the camp store or given away as special gifts. Um, uh, uh, what it says here uh, is... Um, we, we love the lakes. We love lakes. Okay, so that's a cool thing. How many people here love lakes? How many people here would rock a, a Ojibwe language, we love lakes shirt? This, this, is, this is a potential <laughs> <laughs> so That's a cool design. Um, I have a, I have an old t-shirt, uh, a 10, 15 year old t-shirt that says, Ijada Gijigowande. Does anybody know, know that shirt? Know what that means? They're kicking around Ann Arbor sometimes. Go blue. So just Ijad Dag Ijigawande, go blue. And it's I, I gotta tell you, it's quite the conversation starter. It, 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 it gives me it gets me into uh, real conversations with friends and strangers alike uh, about uh, the presence of Anishinaabe people, like that we exist and we have a language, and we have speakers of our language, and it's not a dying language, it's a, it's alive, it's a living language that we breathe life into every time we speak it. Even if you're a beginning speaker like me and you mispronounce words all the time, you're still breathing life into it and it's a living language. Um, and so I, I think that that, that uh, you know, this is a good idea. Um, it, would, it would be a good conversation starter, uh, get us into important conversation. Um, another example is uh, that we see, um, we see different indigenous groups and their allies advocating for the renaming of rivers, lakes, mountains, uh, city streets, towns, etc. Um, for example, the the Grand Traverse Band. Of, so these are a couple of examples here of uh, indigenous, indigenous language signage, where they're just bringing uh, signage to bear. Um, uh, not necessarily a renaming of a lake, but a co-naming of a lake here, in Ontario. Um, and, and I have some friends from the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians that are advocating to rename the Boardman River uh, that goes into Trevor City, to rename it the Ottawa River. Um, but when tribes and their allies attempt to bring back old place names or include indigenous, language, uh, indigenous languages in signage, et cetera, uh, they're often uh, faced with pushback. So sometimes, sometimes pretty harsh uh, English-only pushback for these efforts. So what I'd like to do is just spend a, 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 just a moment or two contextualizing that pushback. Um, I don't want to turn this talk into a huge bummer by any means, but let's just take a minute or two to reflect on all the ways that settler Americans and Canadians have tried to erase the first peoples of North America uh, and to push them into oblivion. Okay? And think about that when we think about people saying, you know, making a big stink about, about trying to bring indigenous languages into our everyday life. Um, so uh, we can talk about, we're not going to go into detail. This is going to drive any historians in the room or, or loss over this. <laughs> we can talk about massive depopulation through military-style warfare, uh, use of biological weapons in the form of uh, infected blankets, uh, killings by militias and mobs, depopulation is the polite terminology, but outright genocide was waged upon populations across the continent. Since the indigenous populations couldn't be completely obliterated, the next phase was to assimilate or, quote, kill the Indian to save the man. Uh, we're still talk, uh, talking about attempts at complete erasure, um, um, and, and, and even even through assimilative practices. So this happened first and foremost by attempting to eliminate the first people's communal connection to land. Okay, so um, uh, tribally shared and communally stewarded lands were encroached upon rapidly and in several large waves by settlers backed by colonial and later U.S. policy and where needed, mili where needed military force. 
Small communal reservations uh, were created and then busted up into postage stamp sized plots held by individual Indians. Plots were then often uh, uh, plots that individuals were often uninterested in farming or, or holding in sole ownership, and so they would sell them, or in many cases, they would be outright stolen by local Indian agents. Um, then Indian children were sent to boarding school, sometimes by force, sometimes because parents saw that it was their best and only shot for their children, given that they were being forced into a wage-based and English-based uh, system. Once in these schools, mostly run by churches, um, children were physically and mentally abused uh, for speaking their, their indigenous original languages, like Anishinaabe and Hawaiian. They were stripped of their culture, beaten, many were raped and, and murdered. So concomitantly, women were subjected to forced sterilization. Women were sterilized in eugenics programs that in some places continued into the 1970s, like in Vermont, where Angie and I now live. So you might think that I'm off on some kind of a wicked tangent right now, but this is really important background information in discussing treaty rights and biocultural sovereignty, which is, the, you know, according to the title of my talk, where I'm, where I'm headed here. Uh, the term, uh, but the term that best describes these various forms of indigenous erasure is settler colonialism. Okay, so we have to talk about that for a moment. Um, we don't like to think about these historic abuses, and when we do, we tend to think of them as, a, as ancient history. Uh, it's less messy and less painful to think about settler colonialism as a singular atrocity that happened a long time ago. But in fact, these are ongoing processes. Uh, indigenous people, especially indigenous women, are murdered at an astounding rates in the United States. Indigenous homelands are still being encroached upon, particularly by mining and oil companies. Just this past year, the United States government took Wampanoag lands out of trust status. That means uh, they're no longer recognized as communally held tribal lands with the type of status that gives the tribe self-determination over key land use and economic. Patrick Wolf uh, is often quoted for pointing out that settler colonialism is a structure, not an event. He explains, and I'll quote, the logic of elimination not only refers to the summary liquidation of indigenous people, though it includes that, settler colonialism has both negative and positive dimensions. Negatively, it strives for the dissolution of native society. Positively, it erects a, a new colonial society on the expropriation of, land, of a land base. Settler colonizers come to stay. Invasion is a structure, not an event. In its positive aspect, elimination is an organizing principle of settler colonial society rather than a one-off or superseded occurrence. Positive outcomes of the logic of elimination can include official, officially encouraged misogynation, the breaking down of native title and the alienable, and all the stuff that I mentioned. So that, that, same, that same list. And then he closes by saying, the paragraph is saying, settler colonialism destroys to replace. So getting back to my main point about indigenous presence, in indigenous languages, groups that push back against indigenous language initi initiatives uh, and, and forward an English-only agenda are continuing the legacy of settler colonial erasure. And keeping in mind the long arc of settler colonialism helps contextualize these movements uh, and other forms of pushback against uh, contemporary indigenous language initiatives. I mentioned earlier that the Grand Travers Band and their allies were trying to rename the Boardman River to the Ottawa River. Does, any, does anybody know where the Boardman River gets its name? Who was Boardman? So Boardman was a timber baron. Okay? Uh, like uh, literal, he, he, he came into the Grand Traverse area um, with one, one, one goal to make as much money as possible and a complete cut and run. Like we talk about cut and run, this guy, cut and run. He clear cut forest, harvested a ton of trees and took off and he's got a river named after him. And so, um, you know, some people are accustomed to the name, and so they're attached to it, which is totally understandable. Uh, but it's also understandable that uh, the, the Anishinaabek who have been there for a very long time would be excited to bring an old name back that doesn't recognize somebody that had that little, that little time there where, where, where uh, you know, just extracting resources. Um, but this brings me to, the, to, the main, to the, my first main point of the seminar. So we've arrived. Um, <laughs> uh, if we care about the continuation and the well-being of indigenous peoples and indigenous nations, this is the punchline, we have to learn how to make space. Okay, so just sit that for a second while we figure out how to do it. Okay, so we have to learn how to make space. 
Uh, how can we say that we care about indigenous peoples and want them to be well now and into the future, but not be willing to make space for them to flourish, to be good allies, or just to be decent neighbors? We have to be ready to make ontological space, political space, economic space, uh, and physical space for our indigenous neighbors' life projects. Uh, it's not that helpful to indigenous causes when people only make connections when it's convenient and easy, or if they just find indigenous people super interesting or appreciate some form of indigenous aesthetic. We have to be willing to make space. And often that means sharing power, giving something up, and or changing plans in a way that will affect our future options. Um, okay, so this, this, this photo is from Mauna Kea where Kanaka protectors have set up a blockade to keep contractors from building another bigger telescope on their sacred mountain, the so-called 30-meter telescope. Uh, this is a prime example of how we fail to make space for indigenous peoples flourishing. How our stance on these issues hinges on our own priorities and values, regardless of the priorities and values of the affected indigenous groups. So for example, many of my scientist friends are disgusted by the fact that Rio Tinto excavated a mine directly on top or under and under Eagle Rock, a sacred site to Anishinaabek in the Western Peninsula. And they're outraged that the Dakota Access Pipeline project was rammed through Standing Rock, Dakota, the sacred land. But these individuals literally had nothing to lose and arguably something to gain if the indigenous groups had gotten their way in these well known examples. These scientists' friends uh, don't look favorably upon gas or mining development, and they were concerned about the environmental impacts of the projects anyways, irrespective of indigenous concern. So it was easy to support the impacted tribes. Um, but when you ask these same folks about the 30 meter telescope, that's an altogether different conversation because they value science and discovery. They want to they wanna expand our understanding of the universe, which is understandable. Um, <clears throat> that's not making space though. Uh, I'm not saying that we that we should look to build alliances and instances. Uh, we should. I'm not saying that we should we, we shouldn't look to build alliances and instances when we have common interests and our, our interests align. Um, but that can't be the only time we support indigenous priorities or try to make space. Even when we're involved in alliances where we think our our priorities and values align, oftentimes important differences are at play, and we don't even realize it until we're well into the partnership. So my own research and the work of other scholars indicates that more of these alliances between indigenous and non-indigenous neighbors, more of these alliances fail than succeed. Uh, one of the main reasons they break apart is because of differences in core values and worldviews. And in instances where it's relatively easy to rally around common goals or vision, like with the groups joining together to try to shut down line five, um, one of the keys to keeping an alliance together long enough to accomplish your goal is to make space for conversations about differences, uh, differences in core values related to the alliance's goals. So in the case of the important work surrounding line, line five, uh, that might look like an exchange where all parties are sharing why they care about this issue, what are the personal and family connections to the Straits of Mackinac, um, uh, describe your relationship with water, uh, what are your hopes for the future vis-a-vis -vis the straits? These types of things. And I, and I hope and imagine that many of these conversations are already happening um, and are ongoing within that alliance. Um, incidentally, a second key element to sustaining these sorts of alliances is to build friendships. Uh, build friendships across difference. So Indian and non-Indian partners building personal, loving relationships over time. Uh, interestingly, the deep discussions about core values that I just mentioned, that's one pretty effective way to begin to build such relationships. So those two things are, are, are linked with time. Um, ultimately, what I've learned from working on these issues for about the last 20 years is that we, we have to learn to make space and, and to support our tribal neighbors, even when their values don't align perfectly with our own. We have to be willing to relinquish some power to tweak or delay some of our own aspirations, to follow their lead on certain issues, uh, to return some land back to their control, to support indigenous languages within everyday spaces, and to acknowledge that rebuilding tribal economic systems is a slow and imperfect but important process. Um, 
And if you're the type of person who likes to throw shade on Indian casinos, that, that, then that last item in the list is for you. Um, so I'll say it again. We need to acknowledge that rebuilding tribal economic systems is a slow and imperfect but important process. Um, okay, so this brings me to the importance of treaty rights. It's in the title. I promised I'd talk about it, so we'll we'll we'll, we'll go there next. Um, okay. So treaty rights are pri are a prime example of how tribes have had to fight tooth and nail to create space for their own flourishing. Okay, space isn't being made for them. They had to they had to fight for space uh, for their own flourishing within the U.S. and Canadian political system. The structures of settler colonialism continually work to constrict the political, economic, ontological, and physical spaces for indigenous life projects. Continually going. But by fighting back against these structures for the retention of their treaty rights, tribes have been able to maintain a little space that helps to ensure their collective continuum. Treaty rights are imperfect and have limitations, but they do create space for tribal self-determination, for maintaining, most importantly, Maintaining relationships with the lands, the waters, plants, and animals within ceded territory. Uh, treaty rights of Anishinaabe people in this region came about as a result of land cessation treaties in the 1800s, including the Treaty of Washington from 1836 that you mentioned. Uh, tribal leaders, uh, and, and, and so this is a map of the, the, the land cessation treaty from the Upper Great Lakes. Uh, we are in treaty territories here in the 18, part of the 1836 treaty. Um, and there's uh, five signatory tribes from that, that particular treaty. Um, tribal leaders agreed upon these, uh, um, uh, uh, agreed upon their, the tribal leaders agreed to allow for white settlement uh, within these territories in exchange for a combination of uh, money, goods, and access to education in some cases. Uh, in many of these treaties, the Indian leaders also made sure to include language retaining rights to continue using the ceded land for hunting, fishing, and gathering. Uh, these particular lines within the land cessation treaties have become the, the basis for uh, what we know today as modern treaty rights. The U.S. Constitution states, uh, and I'm getting a lot of this, this information is summarized really well in the document on the left. Uh, it's from the Great Lakes, again, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. You can go to glitwick.org, go to their publications at the publications tab. That's a free downloadable PDF. It's a really good overview, just like a 20 page overview uh, of, of treaty rights in the Upper Great Lakes. Um, but the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution states that treaties are the supreme law of the land. They do not fade away or extinguish over time. Uh, treaty rights are tribal rights, tribal rights, collective rights, not individual rights. Uh, the rights belong to the tribe as a political body. Therefore, a person can exercise their uh, tribally, the tribally owned treaty rights only as a citizen of the tribe under the regulations of the tribe that they've established. Uh, tribal citizenry is determined by the tribe as a sovereign, self-governing, uh, self-regulating government. Uh, and the idea of treaty rights, um, the idea that treaty rights are the rights of individual is a common misconception held by non-Indian and Indian people alike. Um, I want to, I want to uh, clear up a couple of uh, other common misconceptions about treaty rights. First, uh, the courts didn't give hunting and fishing and gathering rights to the Anishinaabe. Those rights were never relinquished. Uh, the Ojibwe have always had hunting, fishing, and gathering rights, and the courts reaffirmed them. Uh, they didn't create them. Second, the uh, treaty rights are not special rights um, uh, by any stretch uh, enjoyed by the Anishinaabe. The hunting, fishing, and gathering rights of the Ojibwe are known legally as usufructory rights in our uh, form of property rights, so they're use rights. Property rights, we understand in property law, property rights function like a bundle of sticks. Uh, and individual sticks can be retained or removed, and, and that's what's happening with treaty rights. The, the right to use the land is, 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 uh, is not relinquished, um, stated in the treaties. Um, I finished my PhD as new chair, and I finished my PhD back in 2010, and part of that dissertation research was an ethnography of deer hunters from the Lac de Flambeau Ojibwe tribe uh, in northern Wisconsin. I wanted to address a question that was on a lot of people's mind back then and likely uh, lingers today around uh, Ojibwe territories. Uh, the question is, if, if tribal hunters are out there driving pickup trucks and ATVs and shooting high-powered uh, modern rifles and wearing camouflage and, um, uh, you know, then 
What in the world is traditional about treaty hunting? Okay? It doesn't look traditional, it just looks like hunting. Um, so um, uh, it wouldn't be sound ethnographic research practice to just ask hunters, like, what's traditional about what you're doing? People don't seem to think it's traditional. So uh, what I did is I basically talked to them about, I asked them how they teach the next generation of hunters. Other than teaching them specific techniques, you know, like sneak up or something, <laughs> Other than, other, other than specific techniques, like what, um, uh, what is, how do you teach a young person to, to be a, a good hunter? Uh, and to be a hunter in a specifically Ojibwe or specifically Black de Flambeau Ojibwe way. Um, and what I learned from spending time with the hunters in Black de Flambeau is that um, they're really focused on passing along a complex system of morality. I didn't necessarily use that term, but that's, that's what I came to understand. Pass on a complex system of morality to the younger generations of hunters. Uh, they're teaching them how to hunt safely, how to be respectful to the deer and to the land from a specifically Ojibwe perspective. They're teaching them how deer hunting fits into the tribal social and economic system. And, and they're getting them on a path where they can build a lifelong, deeply personal relationship with deer. Okay, so I just want to um, share with you uh, like a one and a half minute clip of somebody from that community who can explain this uh, better than I can. Okay, so um, <clears throat> slides here. Okay, so um, the work that I was able to do in Lac de Flambeau, including having this, this, this Gakane, the, the Ojibwe hunter that was featured in the video, they, they helped me to rethink uh, some common encounters between Indian and non during hunting. I'll share a little bit about those. So sometimes uh, 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 non Indians see treaty hunters out with their modern gear and think that's not traditional. Um, they're hunting uh, based on 1800s treaties, they should have to use. Uh, traditional technology from that era. Um, but first of all, uh, so traditional is kind of a loaded term, and uh, cultural and economic systems change. They always change and adapt for everybody, including for the Anishinaabe. Right? Uh, so traditional is a, it's a tricky term. It means different things to different people, but, but, but cultures can be traditional. Uh, traditional activities can adapt and change. And, and when um, Tribal leaders who signed those treaties were what they were they were trying to protect the way of life by securing their people's ability to maintain relationships, plants, animals, and fellow human members of their community through hunting, fishing, and gathering. They weren't trying to maintain the use of a particular tool of the trade, such as a weapon or a mode of transportation. Um, 
sometimes non Indian, non -Indian residents uh, in, in like sort of tribal territories or near Ojibwe reservations, etc., uh, will see a gut pile um, during the treaty hunting season and think, oh, that's so wasteful. Indians are supposedly conservation minded and use every part of the animal. Um, or they learn that a hunter killed like 14 or 15 deer in a season um, and think, I thought Indians were only supposed to take what they needed. There's no way that guy's going to eat 15 deer this year. <clears throat> um, there's some misunderstandings at play here. Uh, what's happening is we're taking very complex systems of ethics and morality that are, be that are best understood when viewed as part of larger, even more complex systems of indigenous knowledge, and we're boiling them down to short little adages, like the philosophical quote that we've read in that coffee table Indian book. Um, and, and, and so this idea of like take only what's needed, um, use every part of the animal. But Ojibwe hunting ethics may connect to these adages in some ways, uh, but it's more complex than that. First, every hunter is different and requires different amounts of meat to fulfill their responsibilities. Some are only feeding their own household, but households come in many sizes. So this could mean a couple of dozen. Uh, this could mean a couple of deer or a dozen deer, depending on how many people live at home and how often you cook venison. Other, other people are hunting for their extended family, including many elders that no longer hunt. Uh, and they may, in these cases, kill what sounds like a large number of animals um, uh, if, you're, if you're used to operating under state restrictions. Anishinaabe hunters generally ask, for, so I'm going to go in a little bit more into the depth of, of what it looks like. It's, it's, again, it's a gloss over, but more depth than the, than the single quotes. So Anishinaabe hunters generally ask permission of the deer before the hunt. They explain their intentions, and, they, and they're listening for permission before killing an animal. Uh, they tend to kill whatever animal presents itself first, whether that's small, large, male, female, uh, because the deer is uh, uh, viewed as offering itself to the hunter, and it's viewed as disrespectful to pass up this amazing gift. Uh, animals are then treated with reverence once killed. There's no drinking or drugs allowed while working with carcasses. There's no crude jokes about the animal. Care is taken to do a nice job butchering. Really do a nice job. And anything that will be used is saved. But in today's day and age, not all hunters have the time or maybe even the know-how to use every single part of the animal. Uh, so unused parts, like the head or the guts, maybe a hide or the hooves, are set off into a neat pile. You saw Scott and I do, although he, this guy uses a lot of it. He is just about everything. But for, for other folks, you know, like myself, you make, you're making a pile of the things that you can't use making it as neat as you can, covering it up with some vegetation, uh, and then making, making an offering with tobacco. Um, hunters that know that other animals, such as coyotes, wolves, eagles, and bears, will feast on these parts, and they see this process as a way of sharing the kill with those animal relations. Now, that's not the case for everybody, because there's a lot of diversity, many different types of practices. People do these things, people don't, but that's something that I, that, that, those are the, the patterns that I picked up in the ethnographic work that I, that I did and in the conversations that I've had in my life with, with uh, indigenous hunters, especially the Ojibwe. Um, so Ojibwe hunters like Muskakane are focused on cultivating honorable, active relationships here. Uh, they're focused on providing meat for their communities. They're trying to be all of who they are as contemporary Anishinaabe while resisting colonial pressures that try to erase their lives and realities. Uh, this is where the concept of biocultural sovereignty comes in. Um, and I've learned a lot about this concept by reading and speaking with Kupa scholar uh, Kutcher Risling Baldi. Risling Baldi teaches us that biocultural sovereignty describes acts of biological and cultural resistance and adaptation. Uh, or, uh, or, in other words, forms of biological and cultural resistance tied to living biological and cultural knowledge gathering, mobilized as a means of exercising, maintaining, and reinforcing relationships and responsibilities uh, that people have with plants, animals, land, water. Uh, and then I'll quote her here. The practice of gathering demonstrates the continued resistance against colonization, but also the continued management of land and space, regardless of acknowledgement, or support from government agencies. I highly recommend this book, uh, uh, Risling Baldi's 2018 work, We Are Dancing For You, which discusses this concept and other concepts in rich detail and through powerfully personal writing. 
Um, it's the, it won the Book of the Year Award for the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, and I can't, I can't recommend it enough. Um, okay, the final thing that I, wa I want to deliver on for my complicated title of this talk um, is that there is some reflections on how climate change factors into all this, and I'll keep this quick because I know we're running short on time. Um, I've got two main points to share related to climate change. First is that for indigenous populations, climate change is not novel. Settler Americans and Canadians impacted by climate change uh, and or working to, uh, to study it and or working to combat it see our current situation as a crisis, a crisis that is more serious than anything they or their kin have ever experienced. Uh, there's nothing comparable. And for some folks, uh, nothing more pressing. Urgency is the mantra of the day, and for good reason. But something I've written about, along with other authors, um, and, and I'll point you primarily to uh, the one author, but I, I wrote about this uh, idea in this paper. And then more importantly, uh, Kyle Paulus White has written a bunch of papers, and this is my favorite, it came out last year. Um, um, he worked on this extensively, and, and the point is that indigenous people have experienced many waves, many different waves of rapid, transformative environmental change in our history. Settler colonialism has brought about many rounds of horrific environmental change accompanied by the collapse of plant and animal populations, collapse of economic and political systems, massive human depopulation, and on and on. So as Dr. White points out in this, this recent article that I highlight here, uh, all the things that settler Americans and Canadians fear, the worst case dystopian scenarios that we can imagine tied to climate change, have already happened to indigenous populations. So this, this helps to explain why tribes and indigenous individuals are sometimes not super motivated by messages of urgency when it comes to climate change. When NGOs, researchers, or government agencies, tribal and non-tribal alike, uh, try to press indigenous people into rapidly changing their life ways or urgently carving out time to plan for future climate change, they're sometimes met with blank stares. Um, and it, it may not be the case that people don't care. Um, it's more likely that they have a very uh, long time horizon in mind, both in terms of historic experiences of their nation and future hopes and aspirations. So that said, tribes, First Nations, indigenous organizations alike are doing a lot of climate change related work. So they're not ignoring the issue. The Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, uh, uh, which is uh, my tribe that I'm uh, involved with, their natural resource department has done a ton of work assessing the vulnerability of culturally significant species to project, pr projected climate change. Tribes across the U.S. And, other, and in other nation states are developing climate adaptation plans, or in the most extreme cases, figuring out where to move if their homelands are being inundated by rising sea levels or eroded away by storm surge and flooding. Tribal climate change projects often involve longer-term planning than those of their neighbors, extending into the 100-plus year range, or as, as folks think of it in Anishinaabe communities, seven, seven generations into the future. The, the last point that I want to make about tribes and climate change returns back to this idea of making space. Indigenous peoples have long-standing relationships with, the, uh, with and responsibilities to all the plants and animals in their respective territories. As climate change continues to unfold, the plant and animal homelands, uh, the, the homelands of plants and, plants and animals will shrink. Okay, their, their ranges, what I think of as homelands, they'll shrink or they'll shift to new geographic locations. So for tribes that manage treaty rights, um, like those associated with the 1836 Treaty of Washington, their biocultural sovereignty is somewhat bounded geographically by those treaty boundaries. So tribes are trying to sort out issues of their collective continuance and biocultural sovereignty as plants and animals migrate out of their territories or are projected to. Uh, one important dimension of making space is being supportive of tribal efforts to maintain harvest-based relationships and responsibilities and to follow, to follow culturally important species beyond their treaty area. Okay, so this is, this is coming. Uh, this is going to be a, a big issue. Um, so I just want to wrap up and just uh, leave you with uh, this is stuff I've already mentioned, but just to reiterate. Um, the importance of making space that, that I think we need to, as allies, uh, we need to learn how to make ontological, physical, and political space for indigenous flourishing. And that that oftentimes will require compromising uh, uh, 
sharing power, etc. Um, uh, just want to reiterate that treaty rights are important elements of biocultural sovereignty for treaty tribes, um, and that creating physical and political space for tribes to adjust to environmental changes at their own pace is incredibly important. So if they're not feeling the urgency, but they're working on things, then uh, supporting that is, is, is a good thing. And, and that you know, uh, for, for you know, tribes like the Bay Mills Indian community, uh, my tribe, the Cuban Bay Indian community up in Northern Minnesota that have uh, in, in a Maine, uh, that have strong connections to moose, Moose are, are their range is shifting, right? So how do we grapple with that? They're they're shifting their practices somewhat to hunt deer, um, but the relationships that they have with moose and the responsibilities they have to care for moose and the knowledge they have about moose is really really important. So how do we how do we keep that going and honor that? So um, I'll leave you with these bullet points, and um, I just want to uh, say thanks one more time for inviting me here to give this talk. And I want to thank a few of my friends and collaborators um, for help with the Anishinaabe language, uh, for the work we do together. Um, and, uh, and I'll just close by saying, Ijada, Ijada, Ijada.